Nothing compares to the promise that we have in King Jesus. Amen? Not a thing. Nothing in this world, listen, brothers and sisters, nothing in this world compares to the promise we have in Christ. There's, there's nothing in this life that is more valuable than Jesus. There is nothing in this life that will satisfy the longings that you have in your soul, the void, the holes that you have in your heart. Jesus was meant to fulfill those. And as we look at the word this morning, I pray that even if we're in the Old Testament, we would see something of Jesus today. Amen? Because the whole Bible is about Jesus. So, this morning, we're going to begin a brand new study in the lives of two prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. And what we're going to see this morning, friends, is this. Even though they lived thousands of years ago, Elijah and Elisha lived in a time... I was just blown away as I was studying this. They lived in a time that was strikingly similar to our own day and age. And we're going to see some things in these Old Testament characters that lived long ago. Even you'll see some this morning, and you'll sit here and you'll think, wow, this is remarkably similar to what we're going through today. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 16. Now, as you're turning there, you can also grab your bulletin because uh, what I did was I took the liberty of providing some notes for us today. Uh, we won't always do this, but in sermons like this where we have to give uh, maybe a lot of context and a lot of information, instead of me just slamming you with a bunch of information that I know you're probably not going to be able to remember, uh, sometimes it's easier if you just have a sheet in front of you or uh, just a way to jot some notes down because we're going to cover in this sermon really the life and the times of Elijah because you can't understand the man until you understand the times that he lived in, right? Elijah was a real person. He lived in a real place at a real time in history and there are real things going on that God used him for. And if we don't understand all of those things, we'll miss some important truths. So today, we're just going to set the scene. I'm, I'm going to give you some context, and uh, what we'll see are, are things we can fill out on this handout if you would like to. Now, if you're the kind of person that does not like handouts, you can take this, you can crumple it up, and throw it at the person sitting in front of you. Okay, that's just fine. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now, uh, let's, let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 16. Start reading with me in verse 29. The word of the Lord says this. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria for 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now jump down with me to chapter 17, verse 1. This is where we meet Elijah. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Will you pray with me? We have much to learn this morning. Let's ask God to teach us. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how practical and relevant and timely it is, even in our own day. And so, Lord, as we study the life of Elijah, would you help me, God, by your grace? Would you, would you give me the clarity of thought and the clarity of word that I need this morning to communicate your truth to my friends here in this room? And, Lord, would you help us to grasp these truths and to live them out? Because we don't want to be just hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word this morning. Show us why studying Elijah's life is so important for our lives today. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, now let me give you some context here because this particular part of the Bible might just be the most confusing part of the Bible other than maybe Revelation, okay? 
Uh, how many of you, when you've gotten to First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you see all these kings of all these different countries, you, you start getting confused? Has anybody been there before? Yeah, they, they say that Bible reading plans either die in Leviticus and Numbers, or if you're able to get through those, they will die in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, because there's just all this stuff going on. And the reason for that is because the kingdom at some point is split in two. So let me give you some context, some, some history up to the time of Elijah. The first blank you can fill in in your handout is over 100 years of peace. So the nation of Israel starts out with over 100 years of peace and prosperity under the reign of the first three kings. The first king of Israel was Saul. King Saul was anointed as the king. And, and then he was succeeded by King David and then David's son Solomon. And it's not that there were never battles or wars to be fought, but generally speaking, the kingdom enjoyed a time of peace and prosperity. The, the borders of the kingdom were enlarged and the, the people had more wealth and, and there were greater resources. They did building projects like the Palace of the Kings and the Temple of God was built during this time. In fact, uh, earlier in 1 Kings, the Bible teaches us that in Solomon's day, silver was as common as rocks. I mean, there's some prosperity right there. How many of you would like that in our economy today? Amen? Yeah, so, so this was a good season. But the next thing you can write down is that civil war breaks out and the kingdom is divided. And I've got here for you Rehoboam in 1 Kings chapter 12. You can go read this on your own time. I would encourage you to do that because there are many lessons to learn in 1 Kings chapter 12. Essentially what happens is this. Rehoboam decides not to listen to the elders of the kingdom. Instead, he seeks advice from people his own age who don't know any better than he does. How many of you see young people doing that all the time? I see that with teenagers constantly, right? It's like go ask somebody older than 12 for life advice, please, okay? Uh, well, Reho Rehoboam doesn't do this, and as a result, he makes a critical error, and the kingdom is divided. A civil war breaks out, and the nation is divided into two. The, the best way to kind of illustrate this is it almost picture it as if the Confederacy would have won our own civil war. You would have two nations, right? You would have two nations of states. You would have the northern states and the southern states. Well, in Israel, they don't have states, they have tribes. And so what happens is you have a northern kingdom of tribes and a southern kingdom of tribes, and it stays like this. And part of the reason that First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles is so confusing is because when you're talking about kings in those books of the Bible, you have to know which kingdom they're in because there's two to keep track of now. And so the northern kingdom is made up of ten tribes. Does anybody know the name of the northern kingdom? Israel, good job, yeah. So, so the northern kingdom, those 10 tribes, they keep the name Israel. That's the next blank for you. Now the southern kingdom had two tribes in it and it took the name Judah. Judah, very good, it took the name Judah. So now you have kings in Israel and kings in Judah. Now I don't want you to get the idea that just because Judah only has two tribes that it's insignificant because this is where both Jerusalem, the city of David is, and it's where the temple are located. That's your next blank. So even though Judah only has two tribes, they have the place where God has chosen to allow his glory to dwell on earth at this point. The northern ten tribes don't have that. And so what we're going to see is the northern kingdom of Israel, because they don't have a place to worship. They will walk away from God very, very quickly. How many of you know when you don't come to a place of worship like church, for example, for an extended period of time, all of a sudden you're running away from God quick, like a, like a, a train that's off the rails, right? It's important to be able to worship with our brothers and sisters, and it was important in their day too. Since the kingdom of Israel did not have a place to worship, they go downhill fast. In fact, underneath the map that I've got here for you, I've got some information about their kings. So in Israel, the northern realm, there were 19 kings from the time of the civil war to the time that Israel was destroyed. Take a wild guess how many of them served God. Lower. Big fat zero. They were O for 19. Yeah, isn't that wild? I see some jaws dropping around the room right now. It is wild that they were O for 19. That's a terrible batting average, okay? <laughs> One king after another 
walked away from God. Do you think the society was going downhill fast? Are you starting to see maybe some similarities to our own day? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Judah, the southern kingdom, had 17 kings, and eight of them followed God. So they did a little bit better. They were almost at 500, if you will. That's still a failing grade. Uh, but they had more kings like Hezekiah and Joash, who followed God and tried to obey God as they ruled the kingdom. Now, at the bottom of the handout, I've got the kings of Israel up to Ahab. I've got for how long they ruled and the passages where you can read about them. I'm going to show you three of them this morning. So turn with me back to 1 Kings chapter 13. We're going to look at the first king, King Jeroboam. 1 Kings chapter 13. Jeroboam is going to set us off on the wrong foot, and it's only going to get worse from there. So in 1 Kings chapter 13, look with me at verse 33. After this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way. You can circle the word evil there. If you read this section of scripture, you will see the word evil over and over and over again. Jeroboam's the guy that starts it off. But again, he made priests of the high places from among all the people, any who would be ordained to be priests of the high places. So there's two things he does wrong here. You can maybe write them down in the margin. The first thing he does wrong is he ordains priests from any tribe. Now, what was the tribe of the priests? It was the Levites. Does he ordain priests from the Levites? No, he, he just opens it up. Anybody who wants to be a priest, you're all welcome. It's like those online websites where you can get an ordination in 15 minutes so you can marry somebody, right? It's, it's just like that. Jeroboam says, hey, you want to serve God? Okay, you can come over here and work. You want to be a priest? All right, you can offer sacrifices. That's not the way God set it up. There was one tribe that were supposed to be the priests. And the second thing he did wrong, notice here it says they were priests of the high places. That's a Bible term for places of idolatry, places of pagan worship. And if you read through this section of scripture, what you'll find is that instead of letting people go down to the southern kingdom to worship God in the temple, Jeroboam decided he needed to make a competing religion. So he did something very similar to what you see in the book of Exodus. He makes two golden calves. He puts one at the very northern part of the kingdom in Dan, and he puts one in another city called Bethel. And what happens is he tells all of the people, these two golden calves are the calves that brought you out of Egypt. Just like Aaron did in the Exodus. Remember Moses was on Mount Sinai and Aaron, the brother of Moses, did the same exact thing. Here we have history repeating itself, right? We've all seen that happen in our own day. And so he's going to start the country off on the wrong foot. Now turn with me to 1 Kings 16 again. We're going to look at Ahab's father, Omri. Now, in between Jeroboam and Omri, over and over again, you're going to see this. This king acted in the ways of Jeroboam. That king followed in the ways of Jeroboam. They followed in the sins of Jeroboam. And all along the way, you see coups happen. There are kings that are slaughtered and, and murdered so that somebody else can take over the kingdom. The whole kingdom of Israel at this time, for these 62 years, is just in chaos and spiritual decline. And then you get to Ahab's father, Omri. Take a look at verse 25. Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted more wickedly than all who were before him. So you start off with Jeroboam, and then you've got these other kings that each take a step further away from God, and then the Bible gets to king number six, Omri, and says, this guy outdid them all. He was more wicked than all the other guys before him. He went further away from God than all the other people before him. How many of you have seen that in our culture? Every generation walks a little bit further away from God. Have you seen that? I think we can even say that about our leaders too. Can't we? We had a senator this past week indicted on bribery charges, being asked to resign. Somebody who's a leader in our nation, more corruption exposed. And it doesn't really matter what side of the aisle you're on, right? I mean, you can look at Donald Trump's administration. Now, I don't care if you voted for Trump, I don't care if you think he was a good president or if you plan to vote for him in the future, but we can all agree the man has some major scandals and some character flaws. And apparently that doesn't disqualify him from running again. There are character flaws of Donald Trump that would have disqualified him in the age of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. 
but apparently we've lowered the standard. And that's not to say much of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden either. We've seen scandals pretty much from day one with this administration. Both sides of the aisle are corrupt, friends, and we're getting further and further and further away from God. And then you see with Ahab, verse 30, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him as well, including his dad, Omri. So Ahab takes it even a step further. And what you have, listen, what you have in Israel's nation at this point for 62 years for, since the Civil War, they have taken one step after another away from God. And at this point, they're so far from God, friends, that right is wrong and wrong is right. Just like in our day. That's the day that God raised up Elijah to be in. And Elijah just kind of comes out of nowhere on the scene. We're not introduced to him before chapter 17. So if you look at chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Elijah the Tishbite was of the settlers of Gilead, and he said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Or in other words, get this picture. Elijah just walks into the palace by himself. He goes up to the most powerful person in the kingdom, the person who has the authority to put him to death. And he looks the king dead in the eye and he says, King, there's not going to be dew or rain on the earth for three years. You've walked away from God and the result is a famine. God's judgment is now here. And I want you to notice this. Elijah doesn't sit down for tea with him. Right? We don't do a diplomatic handshake. There's no conversation. There's no dialogue. Elijah walks in the room and says, Ahab, you don't even get a warning. It's too late. The nation has walked away from God for too long. And his patience has reached its limit. There will be neither dew nor rain on the earth unless I say so, Ahab. And it's going to last for three and a half years. Friends, what happened over those 62 years is for 62 years, the nation of Israel kept heaping up judgment and storing up judgment upon itself. And eventually there was a day of reckoning. And I want to say something to you because I love you. Our nation, make no mistake about it, is heaping up judgment and has probably been doing so for a little bit longer than 62 years. Amen. I think God has been very gracious to us. We need an Elijah-like person to stand in the gap in our day. And that's my prayer for us as we study. So flip over your handout onto the back. Here are some lessons. Why should we study the life of Elijah? Well, the first reason is because Elijah lived in a day of spiritual decline like we do. Elijah lived in a day of spiritual decline like we do. The town I used to live in in Pennsylvania... Lewistown, Pennsylvania, I found out not long ago that they installed litter boxes in the schools. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, your eyebrows are like, Ben, where are you going with this? Let me, let me explain this. Apparently, many of the students identify as cats. They wear cat ears. They have tails. And instead of, listen, instead of using the toilet, they use a litter box at school to do their business. I'm not kidding. And they had the taxpayers pay to install litter boxes in each restroom so that the students can use a litter box to go to the restroom. In the country of Wales, three months ago, there was a grown man who decided he wanted to, to identify as a 13-year-old girl. And he now plays sports against 13-year-old girls. He plays the sport of cricket. And as he's running around on the field, he sometimes bumps into these girls and he has seriously injured several of the girls. And nobody, listen, nobody has bothered to tell the man that he's deranged. Because they're so afraid to hurt his feelings, we're willing to put our little girls in danger. Friends, do we live in a world that's messed up? Absolutely. Our nation is in spiritual decline. We don't even know how to define the word woman anymore. Come on, that's an easy one. Is it a birthing person? A menstruating person? What, what, you know, we're coming up with all these different terms. Listen, it's very simple. God made them male and female. There's not a million genders. There's two. There's not a million sexes. There's two. 
But we are so confused because we've walked so far away from God that now it's like he's not even on our radar. And right is wrong and wrong is right. And we're heaping up judgment. Number two, Elijah lived in a day of spiritual idolatry like we do. Idolatry. You know, there were two that we saw at the end of chapter 16. So look with me at verse 32. He erected an altar for Baal in chapter 16, verse 32, in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. They have also made the Asherah. So here's these two false gods. The first one is Asherah, the goddess of fertility. That's the goddess of fertility. This is a pagan goddess of fertility, and you can just imagine what worshiping this goddess of fertility must have looked like. It would not have been good, certainly not pleasing to God. The second one is Baal, the god of rain. Baal was the god of rain because, again, a lot of these people were farmers. They had flocks that they wanted green grass, that they wanted to be able to keep their sheep and their oxen fed. They needed rain. And so Baal was the god of rain, and Elijah is specifically going to confront Baal. In fact, when he goes to Ahab, look at verse 1, he says there's going to be no what? Rain. Rain. There's a reason for that. Here's what Elijah is saying. Don't miss this. He's saying, Ahab, you worship Baal, this pagan god that you think is real, that provides rain for you. He doesn't do a thing. My god is the one who controls the rain. And so unless I say so, because my god's more powerful than your god... There's not going to be any rain. Baal is going to be powerless to provide rain because my God's the one who's really in charge here. Baal's not real. He goes right at their idolatry. Here's the third one for you. Elijah lived in a town that was small, rural, and seemingly insignificant, like we do. You know what's fascinating? We, the Bible says Elijah is a Tishbite from the settlers of Gilead. If you go to the Holy Land, you can find just about anything that's mentioned in the Bible except for this. Here's the picture. This guy lived so far out in the sticks. It's like he just walks out of the woods wearing his camo and he goes into the king's palace and says there's going to be no rain. This guy's from the country. Okay, He's got a farmer's tan. All right? he, he chews tobacco. Okay, he does, he does it all. This guy is rugged. He's a simple man who loves God. And he comes out from the middle of nowhere, walks right into the king's palace, I'm sure not looking like everybody else, and he says, King, y'all missed it. And friends, listen, we sometimes, and, and this is something I want to say to you, so if you're taking notes, look up at me for a second. I want, to, I want to encourage you. I've heard over and over and over again. Ben, we're worried you're going to go someplace else to a big city. Or are you sure you still like it here? We're, we don't have much to offer. Can I say something? I look at all, all of those things are big pluses for me. Okay? Now, I'm not saying God's going to have me here for the rest of my life. But don't worry. I love living here. And I love worshiping with all of you. My family loves being here with all of you. And can I say this? Don't discount Macon, North Carolina. Nobody knew where Tishba was. But God raised up a godly man from a seemingly insignificant place. Is it possible that in our day, God is going to raise up Elijah-like people, not from Raleigh, Durham, but maybe from the Warrentons or the Macons or the Littletons? Yes. Simple people who love God and long to serve God. Think about Jesus. He was raised in Nazareth. Remember at the end of John 1, Philip says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was such a podunk, backwoods, backwards town that Philip says, look, I don't think the Messiah is coming from Nazareth because I can't think of anything good that will come out of Nazareth. And that's where Jesus was from. Friends, listen, don't discount our town. Don't discount that God may raise up some of us to do big things. Just because we don't live in New York City doesn't mean God can't have big plans. Don't discount our town. Number four, he's a simple man who loved God, who longed to be standing against a culture that had gone astray. And here's number five, and here's the big point today. I believe that God looks for Elijah-like people in times like ours. I think in the Bible you can draw parallels. And when times get as spiritually dark as the days that we are living in, God doesn't look for soft, gentle people. He looks for people with a backbone who are willing to go look a king in the eye and say, 
my God is the true God, yours is not. In fact, here's a couple of ways that Elijah does this, just in chapter 17, verse 1. Letter A here, Elijah needed to be willing to stand alone. And my question is, are you willing to stand alone against a culture that's running away from God? Are you willing to stand alone and say, no, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stand on who God is. I'm going to stand on the truth of the Bible. I'm going to stand up for what I know to be true and right because I ultimately answer to God, not to my culture. And it's not my job to make sure that nobody around me is offended. Sometimes living for Jesus means we offend people. Jesus, in Matthew 23, you should go read this. He says, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Jesus threw out some pretty harsh words in his day. He was confrontational. He was offensive when he needed to be. Now, some people like being offensive just for fun. I'm not talking about that, okay? If you just get a kick out of making people angry, that's not okay. That's something to repent of. But there are some of us who are so afraid to offend man that we're actually offending God with our lives. I'm going to say that again because that's important. There are some of us who are so afraid to offend man that we're offending God. Because sometimes God calls us to be offensive to man. By speaking the truth in love. And that's, that's, that's actually the next point. Elijah needed to be honest enough to call people away from sin. Elijah needed to be able to say, Baal is not God. And can I say something, friends? We live in a church culture. I'm talking about the church now. We live in a church culture that almost never talks about sin anymore. And we use softer words like mistakes or shortcomings or struggles. I believe in our day, we need to humbly say, sin is sin. And we can't be afraid of that. Abortion is sin. It's the murdering of an innocent child. We have to say that. Listen, the town gossip is not just a, a person who has a struggle because they like juicy details. No, they're sinning. It's sin. If you can't say no to food and you don't have self-control and you, you tell yourself, well, I just need a little comfort food, at some point that becomes gluttony, which is a sin, and we have to say that. And friends, can I be honest, we need to say that to each other sometimes. I have sin in my heart that I need some of you to call out because maybe I don't see it all the time. And you have to love me enough to speak the truth in love, but you still have to speak the truth. He was honest enough to call sin for what it is. Last one here, Elijah needed to be completely devoted to God. Because unless he wasn't, if Elijah was completely devoted to God, he would have shrunk from the moment. It takes a man who has a lot of confidence in God to walk into the palace and have a showdown with the king while there's armed guards in the room. It takes a lot of confidence in God to stand on Mount Carmel against 450 prophets of Baal and call down fire from heaven. It takes a lot of confidence in God to walk through the journey that God will take Elijah through. And it will take a lot of confidence in God for us to stand against our own day. Now, here's the point. I've got it in bold here. If God can use a simple man from a seemingly insignificant place and raise him up to stand against the culture of his day, I believe God can do the same thing in our day. I believe God is doing the same thing in our day. I think he's raising up Elijah-like men, Elijah-like women, and Elijah-like teenagers and children who are going to stand up for what's right in our culture because we will either have that happen or we will be destroyed. Judgment is coming if our nation does not turn. And at some point, we have to be honest about that. So the question is, are you willing? The question is, are you willing? Friends, I want to say something. I know we live in rural North Carolina, and a lot of the nation's depravity hasn't reached us yet, but it's coming. I never thought it would get to Lewistown, Pennsylvania, and now there's litter boxes. There may be a day where there's litter boxes in our schools, or even something worse. It's coming here. The question is, listen, the question is, when the depravity gets to our town, will we be cowards or will we be courageous? How will it find us? 
Will we have a backbone to stand for God, or will we shrink from the moment and let the culture continue to seep into our town? Friends, we need to be men and women who stand up like Elijah, and we're going to look at how to do that in the coming weeks. Now, here's where I'm going to leave us. If you're sit sitting here and you're thinking, Ben, I don't know if that's me yet, that's okay. Because Elijah isn't quite the man that God wants him to be yet either. And the, the next two weeks, we're going to watch God train Elijah through the school of hard knocks. And he's going to do the same, perhaps, with the many of us. He's maybe doing this in your life right now, and you don't realize it. So we're going to watch the next couple of weeks how God is going to make Elijah a man of God. And we're going to see how he wants to do that in our lives as well. Will you pray that he does that in us? Will you pray that this church is maybe a beacon in our community that stands for what's right? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Elijah and for all that we have to learn. Lord, you know how excited I am about this study and this series. Not just because this is fascinating, but because it is so relevant for our own day and age. And God, I do, I pray that you would raise up Elijah-like people all across our church who will stand against the depravity of our culture, who will say enough is enough. God, help us to speak the truth in love, but Lord, do help us to be honest. God, in, in moments where we feel like we're standing alone, remind us that with you we are not alone, and with you we are assured of the victory. God, would you help us? Give us your grace. Make us into men and women of God who are not afraid of our culture, but who are courageous enough to stand with you against culture. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.